education hasn't changed a whole lot in the last hundred years, and all of us know that something is brewing and it's about to change. So I want to talk about a few of the forces that are driving the change of education and a few of, I, a few of the things that I think uh, will happen or that we might do about it. I want to say that I'm not a, a theorist in this subject. I'm just uh, somebody who's working uh, in, in education, so my ideas are not uh, uh, driven like Daniel Pink's by deep scientific uh, uh, study. Take it for what it is. Uh, I believe that education will change because we suddenly have a new kind of students which are coming into the world. We have new kinds of work uh, uh, that uh, require a, a different kind of education. The world is facing some really nasty uh, challenges which uh, society has to respond to and that the effort to respond to those will cause us to do different things. And finally, our educational system has gotten completely out of hand in terms of costs and we can't really afford to educate all the people to the level that we need to educate them and we have to do something about this. So all of these challenges are going to push us to do something different than we're doing today. Let's start with new kinds of students. Uh, I teach older students than most of the people who teach in this room. The average age of my students is 34, but it ranges from 22 to 65. So only about half of my students are digital natives. Uh, and certainly I'm not at age 68, a digital native. And so uh, it was kind of challenging when I first uh, began teaching people who were always online. I couldn't tell exactly what they were doing, were they doing their Facebook, uh, or uh, were they even paying attention, were they multitasking? Uh, and uh, I had to really uh, find ways to be more entertaining uh, in order to hold uh, uh, people's intention to involve people more in the, in, in the classes. But there were also really good things about this. Whenever a question came up in the class that I couldn't answer and that nobody in the class could answer, there was generally a pause of about 15 seconds to, uh, to a minute before somebody had figured it, found, found it online and brought the exact answer into the class. And so the dialogue was deepened by the fact that we had real facts in many cases where we were otherwise would have just had uh, opinions. And I found that this was really an exciting way to teach because it ended up that the students were teaching the teacher as much as the teacher was teaching the students. And I think that that is a, a very big part of what will be necessary to teach the students in the, in, in the future. There are two uh, uh, things that I want to talk that I think are particularly effective in, the, in what we've learned about this. One is inquiry-based learning. And in inquiry-based learning, we don't give students the answers. We just give them the questions and say, go out and find the answer to this uh, yourself. And uh, this is highly motivating to the students. They actually learn better. And they also learn a bunch of skills, which are going to be more important to them in life than whatever concept we thought we were teaching at that time, which is how to find out things for yourselves. The other thing is that we do a lot of this in teams. And uh, uh, this works nicely just uh, from a, a, a pedagogical point of view, because you have uh, five students making one report out about what they found. We send them out. They work as a team. They, they bring that all together and they have the experience of working in teams, which is how they're going to work when they go out there in the world. And so I think that learning how to do that is really important, particularly if they reflect on that and catch themselves in the act of being themselves and reflect on whether that's the way they want to be. And this leads to uh, uh, personal growth and personal development in the sense of getting your own ego out of the way of what you're doing and, and figuring out how it is really necessary to relate to other people and how you can become the kind of person who has enough uh, uh, of your own uh, self-confidence and development that you don't have to have a whole bunch of defense systems getting in the way of doing what you're doing. Because in team-based learning, you get called on all of those uh, things by your, uh, by your uh, teammates and develop in that uh, way. On the other hand, there are some real problems with team-based learning, and one of them is how do you evaluate students? Now, this is a little easier in my school because we don't give grades. We just have pass-fail. And that, I think, is a good thing. But uh, uh, it's still necessary to do something about what's called the free rider problem. What about the student who doesn't do any of the work, but their team presents well because there's some people on that team who are really doing the work? And how do we deal with that? We've only found two things that are really working in that area. One is peer-based feedback in which the students evaluate each other. And it turns out that if there's a consistent slacker, students are actually not afraid to bust them. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the second is individual exams to see whether the content is actually uh, getting across. So I'm really interested. I suspect there are people in this room who know more about this than I do, how to manage that problem. Now, there are also new kinds of work. We're moving from, uh, from a 20th, 20th century kind of work to a new kind of uh, work. And uh, 
we talk uh, uh, about creativity as being an essential part of that. I would also like to suggest that caring is a very important part of what people can do that computers just can't do. When I'm lying on my deathbed and a machine whirls into the room and says, how are we doing today, Mr. Pinchot? I will not be consoled. <laughs> it takes a real human being who actually cares how I'm feeling and cares how I'm going through the progress of coming to terms with my own death in order, in order for me to feel that something has happened in that, uh, in that relationship. And a lot of what we do at work now is in fact about caring. A lot of management is about caring. A lot of sales is about caring. If you're the concierge in a, in a, in a hotel, a lot about what you're doing is about caring about the guests. Uh, this is increasingly an important skill. And so how do we deal with uh, caring in our educational uh, situation? Well, one of the things that, uh, that, that we do in our school is we have an opening circle in which the entire school sits, sits in, in, in circle. People give each other appreciations. People bring up uh, the problems which they're, uh, which they're facing. And the school gets uh, to uh, have kind of a, a, a common community building experience. I can remember one, one morning one of our students said, my parents have just been abducted, abducted in, in Lebanon, and I have no idea where they are. Now, the entire school day is going to be different after that, uh, after that statement. All the little frictions which were going on in the school suddenly don't seem very important compared to the fact that somebody doesn't know whether their parents are dead or alive. And it becomes really apparent that love is the only solution to a problem of this kind. And people reach out in the school, not just to the person whose, uh, whose parents are, are abducted in Lebanon, but in fact to each other in a completely different way. And you build a community where a visitor will come and watch what's going on and say, I've never been in a room of 40 people, all of whom loved each other before. The kind of uh, uh, experience that takes place when you do that is the kind of experience that we want to have in our workplaces. It's the kind of community that we want to have in all aspects of our lives. And if we can teach our students how to build community and how to, uh, and how to find a way to make love an okay word to have present in, in the workplace, uh, they're going to be a lot more effective in the world. Now, creativity is also important. And I, I don't know how much I want to say about this because so much has been said, uh, uh, said before. Uh, there are all the art-like jobs which are exploding, uh, graphics and, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, these are uh, all the design uh, uh, thinking which is going into everything which we're doing today. This is all sort of obviously creative stuff. But so is cooking. So is management. So is dealing with that emotional problem which is uh, in front of us. So is almost everything we, we, we do in life, and I think, I guess, Dan made that, uh, that, uh, that point. But it's also true that school, in general, is destroying the creativity of students. Everybody in kindergarten thinks they're creative, and in fact, everybody in kindergarten is creative. By the time they get to high school, very few of them even believe that they're capable of creativity. What are we going to do about this? In, 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 in being creative, there are no right answers. We have to suspend judgment. We have to love every new idea. We have, to, uh, we have to, well, treat it the way a mother treats a child. Or uh, one of my favorite analogies is uh, when a butterfly emerges from the cocoon. Its wings are all crunched up like this because they've been stuffed inside that, uh, uh, that cocoon. And they're brown and sort of ugly. And over about half an hour, the veins and the wings inflate and the wings spread out and they dry and develop those iridescent colors, and the butterfly begins moving its, its, its wings, and it finally gets to the point where it can fly, and where it turns out that the idea of wings was really a good idea rather than a waste of energy. And that's what creativity is like. How do we make it okay to fail repeatedly as we do in skateboard? How do we make it okay to have lots of good ideas? Another thing that we have to deal with is a multicultural world. Uh, partly because the U.S. is more cultural and partly because the world is more global than it used to be. And uh, what do our graduates really need? Well, one of the things that they need is to talk a lot of different languages. So how are we doing in, in, in America in raising uh, people who uh, can talk a lot of different languages? Not very well, I think. And yet, this is part of what we need. I mean, how can you really understand a culture if you can't talk the language? I want to make a radical proposal. I want to suggest 
This not necessarily is what we should do, but it's kind of a thought experiment that will help us to get to what we want to do. What if we do not teach reading or math until third grade, and all we teach in preschool through second grade is languages during the time in which people are most able to learn languages, during a time in which virtually every student is ready to learn a language, as opposed to many students who enter into first grade and are not ready to learn to read or not ready to learn math, and therefore gain a lifetime feeling that they are failures at, uh, at, at being educated. And it turns out, I've been told, you educators uh, who are more into this, I'm not a grade school educator, that if you start teaching someone to read in third grade by sixth grade, they read just as well as they would have if you'd started in preschool. That it's actually the, what's slowing them down is developmental ability, not, uh, not the amount of training they've had. Now, if this is even remotely true, it's sort of silly that we don't try something like this and find out whether it works or not. There are emerging challenges, uh, climate change, the growing divide between rich and poor. I was at a uh, meeting at Vulcan uh, uh, with David Orr recently, and uh, he said, you know, the big challenge I have, he's, a, he's at Oberlin, a great uh, environmentalist, he said, the biggest challenge I have is if we tell the kids the truth about climate change, how, how can they have hope? And I think this is a really good issue because kids really need to have hope in order to go on in the world. And yet, as a result of what uh, scientists are saying, uh, the world might be a really unpleasant place. We live right in the habitable temperature zone, in the place uh, where life is, is most robust. And if the temperature of Earth goes up uh, 6 degrees C, uh, it's going to be a lot less habitable. We're going to lose the Nile Delta. We're going to lose lots of Bangladesh. We're going to lose a lot of the best farmland in the world. And Oh dear, it turns out that the Midwest is going to dry out too, and, and, and many of the breadbaskets of the world are going to become deserts, and billions of people are going to starve to death. I don't know if those are true facts, but it certainly looks like, it looks like things are going kind of in, 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 in that direction. I don't know if we've passed the tipping point, but I'm pretty sure that from the look of things, we're going to keep on putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere until we do reach the tipping point, because it's not until temperature begins to accelerate upward that anyone is going to really do anything about it. Now what do I say to the kids? They're going to figure this out for themselves, probably, but what do we say? And what, uh, uh, what, uh, what David, well, there's one idea. Wait a second. We could go into denial, right? What David Orr said is something that I actually think is probably part of the solution, that hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. And what we have to do is, along with sharing what might happen, and begin talking about what we can do about it, and begin actually doing it in the school. Helping the kids to actually do something about climate change is the only way that they could possibly be hopeful. I, I, I have a blog post called Recovering from Climate Depression in which I try to dig myself out of my own depression on this subject. And that's sort of the first step. Uh, the next step is, of course, seeing a positive future. But the first step is just to get busy doing something about it. Now we have the same problem in the growing divide. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. We all know that this can go to a certain point and then the civilization starts, stops functioning. And we live in an age in which a few people can cause a lot of trouble, right? If you go back to the Middle Ages, one person aimed with a sword, how many people could they kill before someone got him, right? Five, ten, you know, if they're a really good swords person. Now it's not, I, I, you know, if, if you and I got together and we had terrorist uh, ideas in our mind, we could kill thousands of people before, uh, before they caught us. And we're going into a, a, a situation in which it's eventually going to dawn on people at the bottom that they are not on their way up. Social mobility has declined in the United States. It's now below social mobility in Europe. How's that? The old world is actually more flexible than we are. If you are born dirt poor in the United States, uh, you will probably be dirt poor for the rest of your life. That's the actual facts about this now. And we have to do something about that. So less expensive education might be part of the solution to that problem, although there's lots of other reasons why education needs to get less expensive. Uh, uh, government support, as you all know, is declining. Uh, school debt is becoming insupportable, particularly when you realize that, for example, graduating from college no longer gr uh, guarantees a good job. How are you going to pay for college? It's all right if you have rich parents, but other than that, it's a gamble. And we need to educate everyone. Now, 
one of the keys, I think, is that as student-faculty ratios get worse and worse, we've got to do something about that. And students teaching students is the obvious answer that nobody is paying attention to. Why can't the kids who have already got it be spend their time teaching the kids who haven't got it? First of all, that's the best way to actually learn the material. Secondly, it gives them social status and therefore gives motivation to actually learn things. And finally, it gives the kids who have not got it yet a personal coach who will figure out how to get them through the thing and so that they actually learn it, so that in fact everybody learns this stuff instead of just a few people uh, uh, learning it. I think this is really obvious and I hope we can find ways to do more of it. Second thing is, is that I think accreditation is really getting in the way of educational innovation. Uh, <laughs> I have some personal experience with this and some scars which I won't uh, share, but uh, uh, look at TED Talks. Look at the School of Inspired Leadership, which, uh, excuse the misprint, and look at the Khan Academy. How many people know about the Khan Academy? If you haven't, uh, just check it out on the internet. It's, a, it's an amazing phenomenon. 2,000 free learning bits, uh, which are available at about 15 minutes a piece, uh, and all done by one person. What did it cost? Not very much. And yet, millions of people are using this to educate themselves. TED Talks are fabulous. Uh, People are learning from them. These are all things where accreditation hasn't had the chance to screw it up yet. And so, they, <laughs> and so they're cheap and effective. Uh, uh, I finally want to close with a 20-year-old uh, 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 story that I think holds great promise for us today. Uh, at Stanford, there was an engineering course which was given in three ways. There was a live lecture in the normal Stanford uh, way of doing things. There was a satellite feed with all the technology that you need. You could phone in questions and so forth, so it was just like being in the room. And, oh, they made a videotape of it and shipped it off to Hewlett Packard, where uh, they uh, played that videotape to small groups of engineers with a facilitator whose only job was to stop the tape uh, if uh, someone raised their hand, facilitate a class discussion, <laughs> and started up again. And it turned out that the less the facilitator knew, the better it worked. Uh, if you sent in a really bright student, uh, they would try to facilitate, they would try to teach, but what you really wanted to do was just stop the tape, wait for the students to figure it out, and start it up again. Uh, what happened? When we ranked the outputs on this, the satellite feed was the worst, the live lectures came out in the middle, and the videotape uh, uh, at uh, Hewlett-Packard won, even though the students at Hewlett-Packard were, by all educational standards, inferior to the students at Stanford. This is not a, a small sample. 15,000 uh, students did this. Uh, and they averaged half a grade point higher than the live lecture. That's a lot higher, right? This is not a, this is not a little thing. This is, this is a big thing, half a grade point higher. So, what have we got here? We've got the pod-based learning system. The unit of instruction is not a student, it's a group of five to seven students. They are co-located somewhere, but they do not necessarily live anywhere near the school. We just send out the materials and the instructions as to what is supposed to happen with this group of people. Uh, 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 here's your uh, weekly assignment, get together and do, and do this. And, and, and they do it and they figure it out uh, themselves. Uh, uh, and. Uh, this is potentially far less expensive than any form of, uh, of uh, education other than perhaps computer-aided uh, instruction, but it also has the benefit that it has all the social value of really being in school, uh, that the students are learning from each other, that we can do all the feedback systems that we know work in which we cause people to reflect on what they're learning as social beings as well as what they're learning uh, conceptually. Why aren't we doing this? The costs of doing this are local. If we do this in India, the facilitator is in fact uh, from India and gets paid at Indian uh, level wages uh, and so we can keep the costs relevant to whatever, uh, whatever place we're delivering this, uh, this uh, learning. Uh, I think this is another one of those things where we obviously should have tried. Now they stopped it at Stanford because the Stan Stanford said, well, we really ought to let the students ask the professors questions. Now that was their mistake. <coughs> Because once they started asking the professors questions, the professors objected and said this is taking way too much time, so they shut the program down. They didn't have to do that. Could be still running today. Thank you very much.